Hello and welcome to the first episode of Comic Movie Master List from Hit the Books Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Holcomb. And I'm Emery Saunders. And I'm here to give you all the saucy deets on all of these superhero movies. Feature-length films, both going to theaters and otherwise. All of them. All of them. We're going to try our best to stick in numerical order. If you've been following the podcast at all in recent weeks, we've been uh, hinting at this and uh, discussing how it's going to work and how it's going to be. So feel free to reference those episodes. We'd really appreciate the support. However, this will be the first episode. Kind of feeling things out. Hopefully uh, the format works pretty well for everybody. If not, let us know. We'll be happy to make adjustments on the fly if we need to. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, So we're going to try our hardest to go in numerical order as far as what date they were released. Uh, We did have to put some restrictions on what we define as a comic book movie and what constitutes what we'd be reviewing and what we won't. Because quite frankly, there's a ton of serials from like the 1900s and beyond all the way up to the 1950s where it's like... 24 or 36 episodes of serials that were basically shorts that were aired in between other actual movies, you know, or yeah. as something for the kids when you take the kids to the theater to watch, you know, before the real movie starts or something like that. So there's a lot of that stuff. So keep in mind, this is not the first attempt at some kind of film in a theater or some kind of, you know, feature thing, but it is the first single piece made together coherently for the purpose of making a film um we're not going to talk about necessarily tv shows unless like this case the feature length film was meant to be a starting point for a tv series or something like that um and there are a few made for tv movies that we'll be reviewing as part of this process because once again while the goal is to introduce us to the television show it wasn't the point. the The point from the onset was to create a film, uh, so that's kind of how we're defining things and to kind of condense things. Um, we will be focusing mostly on English source stuff to begin with, but that's not to say we won't do. You know, um, what was that French comic that they recently did? The sci fi one uh, it was last year. Valerian. Valerian. Thank you. It wasn't coming to my brain. But I'm sure we'll get to stuff like Valerian, and I'm sure we can jump over to manga and all that stuff down the line. But for now, just to keep the series kind of coherent and predictive, um, we're going to go ahead and focus on the English source comics. Um, If it's not sourced from a comic book first, we probably won't be reviewing it as part of this series. So, for example, Star Wars was originally a movie that was based on some stories written by George Lucas but not published or anything. And then it eventually became a comic book series and extended you know writing universe uh, and video games and all this other stuff but it started as a film series so it's not going to be reviewed within the context of this show so this comic book movie master list is about movies that were sourced from comic books themselves that were first a comic book and then produced into some sort of comic book related movie even if it's not necessarily based on the comics themselves it's more of just a namesake which there's a few of them um so keep that in mind um we're probably not going to explain things quite as intensely moving on from here but just to kind of introduce everybody to the series this is what we're going to be doing from here on out uh feel free to come back and reference this episode if you so choose um so without further ado let's get into our first film uh there will be a link in the description of both the podcasts and the youtube channel that you can use to check out this movie for free uh somebody has very kindly posted this on a daily motion uh video so you can watch the full movie in its original form without paying anything or going out and subscribing to any service Unfortunately, despite its age, <laughs> WB is very protective of its rights. Yep. So you can't find it on YouTube in a unedited format. It's like either super zoomed in and the auto's really altered and messed up. Yeah. Or it's just not what it's advertising or it's a clip or something like that. And because WB is so restrictive with the rights and we've been caught by this before for s- small, short little sound bites and stuff like that. 
We're not going to be posting any clips. We'll post images if you're watching the YouTube video. But unfortunately, because of the algorithm and WB's enforcement of the algorithm, can't really uh, post any clips of the movie. So you'll have to watch the movie. And if you haven't watched it yet, we highly recommend you stop the video, go watch the movie, then come back and join us for the discussion because it really is an interesting thing to watch. It's <laughs> yep, it's very surprising uh, in a lot of ways to modern viewers, I would think. Yeah. And I, I think Emery and I both have a lot of opinions about this version of Superman uh, and yep. ab- his effectiveness. Yep, we sure do. <laughs> um, it's a time capsule. There's... Hillbilly Justice, there's weird mole men, there's <laughs> who may or may not be mole men. It's it's very weird. It's like a, a very strange, maybe not quite as good uh episode of Twilight Zone. Yeah. It's it's I, very strange. It definitely felt like watching an episode of The Twilight Zone. I mean, I would not be surprised if Rod Sterling just <laughs> popped out of nowhere and started narrating halfway into the episode, because it has that vibe, it has that kind of soundtrack. Yeah, this is very... Uh, <clears throat> okay, in its depiction of Superman, this is very, very early. Yeah. Like, really, really early. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, there's a lot of context that's important to understand and kind of fun and entertaining to watch, you know, from a modern perspective, uh, yeah. you know, 70 years after it was released. Um, so it's really cool. Definitely go check it out. Like I said, the links in the description of both the podcasts, uh, whether it's Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, you name it, it's out there. YouTube will also have it in the description. Feel free to click on it there. Um, really great tool. It's great that we can watch it for free. Even though WB is sucking his claws into YouTube, there's still other avenues. And you know, for a 70 year old movie, you know, what what money are you seriously hoping to make from this? Uh, apparently, um, two dollars and ninety nine cents for anyone willing to watch it on Prime Video. If you would like to watch it on Prime Video, it is there for you. So, yes. Um, feel free to give WB your money for a 70 year old movie, but you know, <laughs> there's other options. Give there WB are. money for their comics. You know, support it, that. Yes. Support your local comic book shops. Please. Especially in a crisis like right now with the pandemic, the coronavirus. They desperately need it. They, yeah. We'll talk about that on the next episode of the podcast because yeah. uh, a lot of things happen here in Ohio that uh, I think are very relevant for that discussion. Um, Indeed. So, uh, again, if you, you would be so kind, we do have a Patreon page. So if you enjoy our content, enjoy watching our videos and uh, listening to the podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash hit the books and take advantage of some of the, the uh, contribution tiers. If you would like to help support the show and keep the show running, it really does help us out. Once again, thank you to Heather Reap for helping produce the show. Uh, she pr- uh, has helped us uh, produce the show at a producer level, executive producer level for quite some time now and we're very grateful to her uh her and previously will beasley great contributors that helped us quite a bit and we're very thankful for both of you um you helped keep the show running and uh i I think if you look at episode one to (laughs) our current episodes there's quite an upgrade in terms of quality of the camera and and editing and the actual studio space so Progress like this isn't possible without your support. Yeah, and it only becomes easier and easier as time goes on with uh, your continuing contributions and help. So very grateful. Thank you very much. However, if you don't want to contribute, that's perfectly fine. We're happy to have you here. Just please give us a like or give us a subscribe because it does help us open some avenues in other ways. So thank you very much. Uh, Let's get into the movie. Yeah, let's jump straight into it. So we're going to use a letter grade system for everything because it's going to be so (laughs) arbitrary to assign a specific number when we don't have a a reference for it yet. Yeah. So we're going to give it a quality grade, you know, A, B, C, D, E, well, not E, (laughs) Americans in the alphabet, Uh, A, B, C, D, and then F if it's that bad. F for fail. Um, And then obviously there's the plus and minuses all the way up the scale if you so choose to use them. And then we'll average our scale for the actual master list. And then if it's close, if it's tied between two, we'll discuss whether, you know, one should be above the other. And eventually we'll have a grand master list with the numbers. I'm going to make a new page on our website, htbvids.com, B-I-D-S. 
um, that you can check out, just like our covers of the week and our blogs and links to our episodes and all that other stuff. So uh, look forward to all that. This episode is going to focus on the number one movie in our master list because it's the first. So by <laughs> default, Superman and the Mole Men will be our number one comic book movie of all time. Because it's first. Because it's first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that will evolve. Uh, so without any uh, spoilers, let's go ahead and talk about our rating. I am giving it a C-. minus. I'm grading on a curve because <laughs> it was the first feature-length film. It is, you know, uh, something that's tied to its era that's obviously limited by its perspective of what's possible, what's scientifically true, um, what, uh, what Superman is defined as at this point in DC Comics history. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that have evolved since then that would change how things are viewed. I mean, if you're comparing George Reeves, the star of this movie, to his son, Christopher Reeves, and the <laughs> 70s Superman film... Superman has quite a different amount of power and ability. Uh, certainly, certainly, there can be some arguments made about his effectiveness <laughs> as a hero. Uh, truth, justice in the American way. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah. there's problems with all of those statements. Uh, it, yeah, uh, so all of them. Uh, you know, does it deserve to be a C minus? Probably not. But within the context of what it is, I'm giving it a very generous C minus. I am actually going to give this movie a a D. If for no other reason than I actually remember at one point watching very old like Superman cartoons that yeah. looked like they came straight out of like the 40s or 50s like yeah, for pretty sure. much like around this time and every single one of those things still managed to make Superman, a character that you could easily read about at that time, about as effective as he is or as he was in those comics of that time. But but this movie fails so hard in doing that. There's certainly some failures. I think the most important ones are the character failures, which y yes, we'll get into. So, without going into any more spoilers, this is your last warning. If you haven't seen the movie and you want to enjoy this episode with us, I mean, if you're watching the YouTube channel, you'll probably get a little more out of it because I'm going to put screenshots and stuff and, and the green screen behind us. But I, I implore you, if you want to really participate in the series... Go watch this movie because it doesn't cost you anything. I guarantee most of the audience hasn't watched this at some point. Uh, you might have seen clips once in a while, but I guarantee most people have not seen this movie, you know, unless they were kids during this era. And even then, who knows? Um, so if go. you were a kid during this era, that would technically make you a boomer. <laughs> yeah. So click click on the link uh, in the description and take a watch before you listen to the rest of the discussion because there's some twists and turns, uh, not as severe as you would think, like an M Night Shyamalan, but there's some twists and turns. So, a little bit. Uh, don't want to spoil things for you. So go watch it yourself, get your own perspective, then come back with fresh thoughts and opinions. Feel free to comment on the YouTube channel or shoot us an email or anything like that. And if you want to discuss it, we'd be happy to discuss it. And we often do uh, on our podcast episodes. So, let's go ahead and get into it. So the movie starts out. Uh, this oil well in the middle of the desert, you assume outside of Metropolis, which is probably like L.A. in this setting. Um, yeah. And they have stopped drilling for some mysterious reason. The employees are tossing stuff into a pit, and the the foreman is out there taking note of everything, and they see basically the, the company executive coming down the way with uh, Lois Lane and Clark Kent in, in tow. Uh, from the Daily Planet to report on the new drill opening and providing new jobs for the region, blah, blah, blah. Only to discover, obviously, they had to shut it down. Yeah. That was... Okay, that entire introduction to this movie, for someone, someone who has, like, maybe a cursory 
knowledge of the character, this does not sound like the beginning of a Superman movie. Like at all. No. So it's it's already kind of alien to us. No yeah. pun intended. Uh, <laughs> but it it is what this story is meant to be, which is kind of a small encapsulated tale. Uh, before we get too far into it, I forgot to talk about the history of the, the actual movie. So uh, let me give you some real quick cliff notes on the movie and give you a little perspective from a modern viewpoint. So this movie was created with the purpose of launching a TV show starring George Reeves as Superman. Uh, his co-star is Phyllis Coates playing um, Lois Lane. Um, the director is Lee Sholem, and uh, the writer for this movie uh, is Robert Maxwell, uh, who used his pen name as Richard Fielding. Um, back in this era, they spent a good sum. They spent $275,000 to uh, create this movie for the launch of their show. The actual purpose of making this movie was to recoup any kind of investment costs for the creation of the show. Just in case the show wasn't a success, they wanted to ensure that they got something back by creating a box office film. Right. Um, so from a modern perspective, if you adjust for inflation, that would be $2,700,000 uh, in 2020 approximately. So... Obviously, doesn't hold a candle to modern film budgets, even with a flight inflation. Yeah, but not even a little it, it, for the fifties, it's a hefty sum, especially post World War II, United States of America. You got to realize the war only ended six years ago at this point. So yeah, and, and given that this this was, as you mentioned before, originally supposed to be the launching for an entire series, which it did go on to make. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there's a little bit of context for you. Um, let's see if there's anything I had forgotten about. Um, this, you'll notice that a lot of this movie has, um, some weird quirks and things that, uh, obviously back then they probably weren't quite as concerned about. Like you see costume zippers and, uh, you know, just weird hiccups where the dialogue doesn't match what actually happened in the scene. Yeah. Um, so th there's some jankiness to it, but again, it, it was the fifties. They're trying to make this sci-fi slash, you know, comic book film. that's supposed to be this big grand adventure. And they're, you know, obviously had a good amount of money, especially for a TV pilot, you know, which this is essentially a TV pilot that yeah. went to theaters. Um, but uh, just, Gives you some interesting context um, and gives you some perspective on how this might have been received or handled. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, dive back into the plot here. So uh, basically the start of the movie, we find out this mysterious foreman is shutting everything down according to the rest of the company, although it seems like other people are unaware of why this is happening. Um, they dive in, they get rested in the town, you know, Clark Kent wants to investigate things a little further. And this is where we get our first kind of fifties ism where yeah. Lois Lane wants to go along. And then he says, Oh, what, what would you need to do down there? <laughs> and she goes, well, what do you need to do down there? <laughs> he goes, all right, come along. <laughs> and then shepherds her like a little child. Uh, yeah. so obviously that probably wouldn't have been seen quite as favorably in a modern modern uh context <laughs> not even a little bit oh my god but yeah it was it was about as mansplaining tastic as possible and this uh, this, this is... movie is nothing but clark kent mansplaining things oh. to everybody and then superman mansplaining things to everybody yeah this is this is a movie that depicts superman as uh the f how do I put this? He is the all-knowing figure who knows better than you what you should do yeah. and what you should be. And, man, that comes off really weird and kind of off-putting. Yeah, it's a little uncomfortable because you usually don't think of Superman necessarily as that type. Mm. You know, you, you can't. There's exceptions, but generally Superman's kind of portrayed as kind of down to earth because he did grow up in the country with the, the Kent family. And yeah. even though he has these grand superpowers, he has a really grounded, fundamental 
uh, morality that comes from growing up on a small farm with loving adoptive parents, you know, um, and it seems weird that he'd be so arrogant <laughs> from the outset and just <laughs> continues to be a super arrogant guy throughout the entire experience. But I again, know what's best for you? It's the kind of John Wayne isms of the time, you know. He, <laughs> it definitely felt like some. He needs uh, to be the man's man. Like there were John Wayne isms, kind of laden throughout this entire thing. Yeah, there's a lot of them, including the hillbillies. Oh my god! To get some. Uh, oh my Country god. justice. <laughs> uh, so we get into it. They go down to the the, the grounds and they discover the watchman has in some way shape or form been incapacitated they show a little scene where these little bald hairy men are crawling out of the, the shaft the the drill shaft and very small wander very into the bald. bushes yeah they're, they're ridiculous looking <laughs> uh, let's just be honest uh so in, in actuality they are actually little people in costumes um <clears throat> I actually have the names of them all, so I'll go ahead and give those to you real quick. Because, you know, why not give them some credit? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. There's one that deserves a lot of credit. Yeah. Well, the main one, he, he did a lot. So he had to run a lot. Yeah, he did. Um, so we got one, John T. Bambury, uh, Billy Curtis, which is probably the most famous of them all. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jerry Marin and Johnny Roventini. Uh, they were the people that had to deal with those costumes and run around through the desert, basically, in their bare feet, you know, in these pajamas, uh, yeah. running away from the hillbillies and the hound dogs <laughs> um, for basically the entire movie. And, you know, <laughs> damn well it was hot as fuck. <laughs> oh. Uh, based on where they're filming, because obviously at the time they couldn't film at night. So what they're doing is they're filming with a lens you know in yeah. the middle of the day in the desert you know couldn't have been fun oh uh, uh they're mentioning hot is definitely a segue into one of the scenes that happens in this movie yeah <laughs> we'll get to it we will so basically Oof. you don't see them do anything they peek through a window where the old man is and then come to this moment where they discover the man is dead on the ground um while they're investigating, basically, uh, Lois is alone in the room, and the mole men appear again and stare at her. She gives out this loud, terrible shriek, uh, again, <laughs> kind of yeah. par for the course in the in the fifties <laughs> and sixties. Uh, just loud, hideous, annoying shriek. You know, like this this is what women do in movies, right? They, yeah, they show up and shriek when they see something frightening, and then they let the men come in and handle it. And it's not it's not the only time we <laughs> see this. Um, so, uh, cut to Clark Kent running in the room. He doesn't see them; they're gone. He's trying to figure out what happened, and then everybody shows up to address the dead body uh, after they call everybody, and Clark Kent's out looking around, trying to figure out where they went. Um, so uh, the doctor, the, uh, the coroner comes in, evaluates him, and says, you know, it seems like he had a heart attack, but I can't say for sure, but he seems the right age, and it seems like that's what happened. He probably had a heart attack. So the doctor and the sheriff head out, uh lois lane goes with them again you know yeah. the whole all right doll go ahead you know <laughs> i think i'll stay behind and the four men's acting suspicious clark kent grills him like a good reporter should which is actually my favorite part of this movie is seeing clark kent be an actual reporter an investigative yeah. reporter which is nice uh usually you don't get that clark kent you get the f fumbling bumbling stupid idiot yeah. you know playing behind like, lois like, you know like the weird like focusing on making Clark Kent an idiot and Superman super competent when I mean you could just have him be just generally competent that's yeah it, so that that was probably the most refreshing thing for me yeah yeah did, I did enjoy how everybody has these pants that are belt waisted all the way up at their chest <laughs> and the, the box suits that are way down at their knees you know yeah that was it's a weird inverted fashion sense the very very strange time we so much covering of like the mid torso area. 
Well, that's where the sin is, baby. <laughs> Gotta cover up the sin. We make it harder to get to, they'll get into less sin, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, again, it's a movie of its era, so it's a, it's a nice little uh, kind of... It's a time Historical anecdote. anecdote. Yeah, time capsule is a perfect term. Yeah. Um, we get into it. Clark Kent grills him a little bit, and finally the foreman says, okay, I'm going to show you something you wouldn't believe. And Clark Kent says, if you can prove it, I'll print it. A lie. <laughs> <laughs> a fucking lie. Because he totally changes his mind on this later on in the film. Um, now... The situation under which he actually changes his mind, uh, you could say that it wasn't him, like, it. while it was him changing his mind, it would be something that, because he was doing it under the guise of being Superman, it doesn't necessarily play that way. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Until you realize that the same fucking person. And well, well, yeah. <laughs> so, uh... uh you know, context issues, but we'll go on. Yeah. Uh, so the foreman takes him into his side closet room, and he pulls out these samples of when they were drilling. He talks about how they had drilled six miles down and then hit a hollow spot. Like, they broke through, and suddenly there was no nothing to dig through. So implying that the center of the earth is hollow. You know, again, <laughs> science, <laughs> modern science would say that's completely wrong. But, you know, for the time i can understand why some writers and directors would think that so yeah there's a it was a very strange time back then yeah and this is where we get into the first kind of you know atomic scare era yeah uh ism yeah, of, this, they, of this movie there's a I, lot I was of not prepared for that there's a lot of talk about radiation <laughs> and different radioactive elements that they might have drilled into um clearly everybody was very ed educated on the subject matter because hodunk pr pr foreman was aware of it so was this reporter who happens to be superman and so were a lot of the townspeople so yeah uh clearly uh, they were very educated and very aware of the threat of radiation and radioactive elements which um, would make sense in context of the time it being the fear of the atomic bomb. Yeah. yeah, that having happened only like what six years prior. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's really cool from that historical perspective, just seeing this and realizing that wow, they they really were aware of everything <laughs> uh, regarding this subject, and they really were well self educated. It seems about the subject matter. So. Uh, really interesting. So the foreman reveals that he basically stopped drilling down because he had discovered some, you know, microbial life form. And he had a little microscope in his office there um, that deep down. And that if he pulled out these test tubes, every time they went deeper and deeper and deeper, they would glow in, in the dark. And then they talk about, well, it could be bioluminescence or it could be, you know, radioactive isotopes that are very dangerous, but we don't know. Um, right. That, that was the thing that kind of threw me off of the whole, like, how are these people so educated? The second that they got into, oh, if it's glowing, it's probably radioactive. That was like a huge, like, oh God, I, this is when they were pushing that. Yeah. So you, you, from the perspective of the characters in the movie, you got to understand like, oh, we don't know <laughs> if this is going to be dangerous or if this is harmless. I was actually kind of surprised they brought up bioluminescence because I don't think that was a real common knowledge at the time, but I might be wrong. Yeah, that seems like the, the type of thing that would have been, one, not only definitely not common knowledge, but two, for the sake of the movie, definitely not something that any any kind of like reporter who isn't like directly reporting on stuff like that yeah that would bring that all the way out into the country and let them like 
even know that that's a thing. Yeah, and you wonder, <coughs> you know, I guess you could talk about like fireflies and stuff like that, how they have bioluminescence. You know, if you squish a firefly and spread it on your skin, it's going to glow for a little bit. You know, maybe it's that type of thing, that type of knowledge. But, yeah, you know, when I think of bioluminescence, I think of like deep underwater creatures and, you know, like mushrooms that glow, you know, right. s- very specific species and stuff like that. You know, was, I don't think of yeah, it would common be- everyday knowledge in the 50s right. where you didn't have the internet where you didn't have you know discovery channel <laughs> you know <laughs> talking about this stuff every day um, yeah it, it seems i don't know uh, given the context specifically the setting that they were in it just seems like so out of left field to even bring that up yeah so i was actually really surprised when i heard that in that scene and i was a i was Surprised by the historical relevance of them being so knowledgeable about different radioactive particles and the potential dangers of radiation because it was such a kind of newish phenomena for them, yeah, you know, within that first decade. Um, and then they talked about bioluminescence, which I was like really blown away by because you know, I'm not saying that you know somebody wouldn't be intelligent enough to know about this type of thing, but. It seems really weird that they're in the Hodunk countryside, and this reporter, and uh, even though he's a superhero, but this reporter and some foreman out on an oil drilling well would know about bioluminescence. So, let alone talk about it as though like bioluminescence is like a common knowledge thing. Yeah. To bring so, I, it was cool. Yeah. Uh, but but it, it makes me kind of wonder about context. So, if we got any older listeners or viewers out there. By all means, reach out to us. Yeah, hit the books vids at gmail dot com, or you can comment on our any of our stuff. I recommend YouTube because we'll probably see it on YouTube. Um, but reach out to us at on Twitter at HTB vids or on Facebook facebook dot com forward slash hit the books. Let us know was this common stuff? Was this common knowledge back then, or is this just kind of a weird quirk of this movie? Yeah, we could do with some educating as to what would and would not be considered, you know commonplace knowledge for like this time period yeah no doubt so uh they they then get a call that um the sheriff and the doctor and everybody heading out of town had crashed the car because they had seen the mole men and freaked out and gotten in a car crash yeah um so everybody rushes to town to try to see what's going on and follow up on this and this is where the country just starts (sighs) Oh, my God. So, in steps uh, Luke Benson, who is played by Jeff Corey. Um, (laughs) He kind of plays the lead hillbilly slash villain for the story. Um, And basically, he riles up the whole town to get their shotguns and rifles and pistols and the hound dog. So, they're going to go hunt down these creatures that are hurting us and you know causing us to crash and then clark kent stop st- comes in and tries to mansplain to everybody hey you don't know what's going on here and here's what kind of irks me about this scene is he, they don't warn them about them potentially being radioactive right away instead he tries yeah. to go with the moral approach with the crowd of angry hillbillies <laughs> yeah <laughs> before arguing <laughs> the very real danger of radioactivity and I can see why they would go that route is like, okay, we want to pitch Superman as the person who believes in the best in people and wants to appeal to people morally before he has to employ what would honestly be scare tactics by telling them like, oh, it could be radioactive. Don't go near it. Yeah. <clears throat> but to me, it just makes it seem like a really illogical choice because... If you tell them they're radioactive way after the fact, it just seems like you're making shit up to try to get them to stop. Yeah. Whereas if you tell them up front, hey, there's a real danger of radioactivity, let's not go too close to them because it could be dangerous, and then start going into, well, maybe they, they're not even aware of what's going on. You know, we're just a strange blah, blah, blah. So <clears throat> I understand why that's weird, but uh, it just seems really out of place i get that it's important to keep the story rolling for what they're trying to tell yeah but i mean again how common was all this scientific knowledge you could probably just go ahead and let the hillbillies just be hillbillies and try to chase them down yeah 
regardless, uh, but it just seemed a little illogical. And then we get the first dose of probably the worst Lois Lane of all time. Oof. So Lois in this movie is insufferable. I can't <laughs> stand it. Superman's bad, but Lois is insufferable. Somehow. And every scene, she is just a, a complete, you know, for lack of a better term, bitch to Clark Kent in every single scene for no reason. It's like she can't help it or something. She, even though he's the one leading everything throughout the entire thing, he's the one trying to challenge the people to not act too irrationally or whatever else. She's the one cheering him on, going, Go get him, hillbillies, you know, <laughs> and calling Clark Kent a coward and, you know, telling him he's an idiot and he doesn't know anything. And like, just, yeah. When he's the only one that actually knows something about what's going on, you know. And it just seems really out of place and really obnoxious. And to me, it's the writer and director probably not having the best respect for women and wanting her to be the annoying, nagging female role and I, I <laughs> instead of see... the independent, strong reporter, you know. I, I could lo- see how you would bring that or see that. From yeah. That. And maybe yeah. it's just me, but I. When I think of Lois Lane, I think of the really smart, cerebral, you know, type A personality that wants to be gung ho about everything and get to the bottom of everything. Not, and she's not, maybe she's aggressive, you know, because she is that type A personality, but she's not just downright cruel and vindictive and I just, and and nagging, (laughs) you know. So, I, again, it's a time capsule, it's something of its time, but. This is definitely not the modern Lois Lane we think of when we think of Lois Lane, the the big reporter uh, for the Daily Bugle, you know. Yeah, absolutely not. Oh, also, da- uh, Daily, Daily Planet. Planet. Yeah. Sorry, get my universes screwed up. Sorry, guys. Y- yeah. Uh, my biggest issue with this version of Lois Lane, trying to take everything into account, my biggest issue with Lois Lane is, well half the time it seemed as though she didn't even need to be there. No, she's completely unnecessary for the story. Yeah. Beyond giving out that (laughs) ridiculous shriek. (laughs) Right. That could have been anybody. There really is no purpose for her being there because she doesn't benefit the story at all. She doesn't really add anything to it. And I would say from a modern perspective, she kind (laughs) of takes away from it because she just makes women seem completely irrational and incapable. And yeah. Yeah. It was. Her performance was particularly hard to watch. Yeah. So that's the thing that probably aged the least well of everything in the film. Um, But, you know, again, time capsule, Unfortunately, it's probably how it was for most of society, more or less the kind of stereotypes that were perpetuated in media. Yeah. Um, so, uh, basically, the mob gets all together and they go out to try to hunt down these little these little people in hairy costumes, <laughs> So, which are barely, basically just little people that have bald caps on them <laughs> with big bushy eyebrows applied and then a big furry suit with zippers on the back. <laughs> Uh, what you see in a few shots, which is pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so, already we're set up for an all-time classic, clearly. Already. Uh, <laughs> Off to a winning start. Yeah. So, people go out to hunt them down, and Clark Kent realizes he can't stop them, so he runs into the back room, and Lois calls him, oh, he's always running away at times like this. What a coward, blah, blah, blah. Even <laughs> though he was the only one confronting the angry mob, but, you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> He changes, and then we get to see Superman with his Superman. incredibly loud flying sound effects. <laughs> so loud oh uh, compared to the rest of the film. Just a <laughs> yeah, the stereotypical <laughs> sound. Uh, and he flies off to try to stop this angry mob from potentially killing these little mole men. Meanwhile, the little mole men are in the bedroom of this little girl playing ball with her, rolling a ball back and forth, and they show the ball start to glow, uh, and clearly illustrating that maybe they're radioactive, maybe it's something else, but hey, 
probably not a good thing. Oh, yeah. And then the mother comes into the room, looks at them, and gives out this terrible shriek <laughs> that I don't understand how she produced the sound <laughs> from a human body. But, um, again, par for the course of the era. Yeah. The angry mob responds to it, goes to find out what happened. Superman goes there, uh, and the mole men are basically all gone, and um, the hillbillies are kind of hot on their tail. Uh, Superman tells them to wrap up in a blanket to protect from the potential radioactive you know, issues and take them to the hospital just in case, and again, the awareness of the time. So right. kind, of, kind of funny that this is the premiere of the series is it's all about radioactivity. Having, oh yeah. It's like, Oh my God, it's glowing. It might be a n- nuclear waste of some kind. Yeah. Who knows? So fast forward, it's nighttime. They're chasing these guys down. Uh, they're up on a dam and <laughs> these hillbillies have spotted them with their lights. And <laughs> I think your favorite, <laughs> what, what'd you say? Go ahead. Oh, uh, so this was a very interesting moment. Uh, it, is a night shot, or the best night shot that they could possibly try to manufacture. Um, they're trying to find two of these weird, bald children. Um, or at least that's what I kept calling them throughout this entire movie. Yeah. Uh, these two mole men. Um, and when it comes to them actually finding them on top of this... Uh, what I'm assuming was a, uh, was that a dam? It's a they, dam. Yeah. yeah, they're standing on a dam. The light actually hits them, and then the hillbillies start to aim. And what do these mole men do to escape from being seen? They just lie down. <laughs> they just lie down. Highly effective. That like I had no idea that <laughs> the biggest big brain move that was going to happen in this movie was. Oh, the lights are on me. If I lay down, they'll move it away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it worked. <laughs> Apparently. I mean, oh Not my for long, God. but it worked. And this is where we get to, again, the least effective Superman of all time. So oh. Superman, oh. with his horrible, airy yeah. sound effects, flies in. He kind of jumps in. Yeah, explains to these guys, hey, don't shoot these guys. We don't know if they're harmful or not, but we know they might be radioactive. If you shoot them, they might fall into the water supply and pollute the entire thing with the radioactivity blah 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 and the lead hillbilly mr benson starts pulling out his his revolvers and starts shooting superman <laughs> superman laughs at him ha 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 with his you know his fist upside down in that stereotypical heroic superman pose you know oh yeah the, and, the, so classic that pose and uh, Superman basically bitch slaps him. <laughs> and while he's busy bitch slapping the main hillbilly, the other hillbilly is aiming his rifle and shooting <laughs> uh, one of the two mole men. And again, how does Superman not stop this? And why is he not paying attention to the other hillbillies with guns aiming at the mole men? I think the um, priorities that Superman had and how he performed what he thought was the right thing to do was laughable. Yeah. And then Superman flies off to catch the little guy in kind of a funny, <laughs> you know, <laughs> old Hollywood scene where you just see this weird <laughs> after image eh, eh, eh. of these two like dolls colliding <laughs> with each other in midair. Uh like, show I, it real quick and then we'll move on to another shot. Yeah. It's just fun, you know, yeah. fun time capsule of filmmaking. But if he was so fast that being able to catch this guy out of midair from falling off this dam, <laughs> but he couldn't stop the guy from shooting him in the first place. Yeah. And then Superman proceeds to fucking leave with the other one still there getting shot at. It's almost like he forgot there were two of them up there. And so he flies the one to the hospital where the doctor won't <laughs> operate on him anyway. <laughs> and the other guy has to run for his life for the next 20 minutes uh behind the most annoying fucking group of hound dogs ever and they just make the scene <laughs> way longer than it ever needed to be i don't know who elvis was talking about when he made that song you ain't nothing but a hound dog but <laughs> my <laughs> fucking god the, like what a fucking insult considering like what I just watched that had to do with hound dogs in it. Yeah. I mean, it was a long <laughs> drawn out chase scene. This had to oh. be this had to be like 
20 to 30 percent of the movie <laughs> was them chasing down this little guy through the desert there's a scene where he comes across a guy in camp and drinking water and shocks the guy and the guy runs away scared and the little guy goes down drinks his water and then keeps running throughout the chase he's touching stuff and it starts to glow and they notice it's glowing uh, and they know not to touch it or whatever else eventually down the line they chase him into this little cabin where he's hiding uh, in this little shed in the middle of nowhere and they decide you know call off the dogs we're gonna light this thing on fire and burn it alive inside instead of risking exposure or whatever right uh so this thing is getting burned alive while superman's nowhere to be found uh again probably the least effective (laughs) heroic superman ever um so superman takes the little guy back into town and then we get introduced to the scene where basically the the head of the company is telling the sheriff hey you know don't call in the state police or anything because it's going to be terrible press we got newspaper here you know why don't you show the press that you you're a good sheriff and that you're able to take care of this and yeah (laughs) then hillbilly justice takes his course shows up literally (laughs) takes their guns from them Oh yeah, at gunpoint in the sheriff's office. And, uh, yeah, and then leaves. <laughs> the guy after- just fucking draws his weapon inside the sheriff's office, and then they still don't call the state police and just what follow the- them out the door. Uh, then we get to a scene where they're talking about you know uh, whether we should tell everybody about this in the press or not, and we get our first uh violation of truth justice in the american way the truth part uh we're just gonna not talk about this says clark kent (laughs) oh so we have clark kent openly oh i guess it was superman technically superman yeah this is the part where i'd i would say that if people were much weirdly like the characters of this show having a problem connecting superman to clark kent somehow yeah it could be seen as like oh superman has an issue with this but he's thinking of public safety yeah this isn't clark kent it's okay to lie completely as as going back the, on like in his the... <laughs> journalistic integrity yeah it's okay to lie as long as it's for the interest of the public safety uh the american good is more important than the americans knowing that hey there are fucking mole men that we just found and uh, we're not sure if they're radioactive yet, but uh, I don't know. Maybe watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and again, it's like it's not like other people aren't going to drill, so it's not like this is going to be like, a what secret. If someone else like drills, yeah. exactly. Uh, oh, for the sake of this movie, six miles into the earth. Yeah. So very silly. Very uh, again <laughs> against what Superman is all about, and Clark Kent should be all about. But uh, it's the first kind of violation and then the second violation is obviously the justice because Uh, we just have hillbilly justice being carried out left and right and superman just bitch slapping everybody for no reason because that's his answer to hillbilly justice apparently yeah so i'm starting to think that maybe superman might be a little bit more modern than we thought so we have a scene at the hospital where the the director of the hospital doesn't want anybody operating on the little guy and doesn't want anybody helping him because it's an alien. Basically, you know, easy analogy for marginalized people. Yeah. Um, and then he leaves and tells the doctor not to operate, but the doctor's a young guy and he says, screw that, I'm going to operate on him anyway. And then Clark Kent in his full box suit puts some scrubs on over his full box suit and goes in to help out. <laughs> Because that's just what you do when a medical professional asks for assistance. Like, yeah, sure, I'll help. After he's been running through the desert all day. (laughs) Super sanitary, I'm sure. They were learning, I guess. (laughs) Uh, Like, we didn't have just uh, hillbilly justice. We had hillbilly medicine on top of that. Yeah, so they go ahead and get the little guy taken care of. Uh, get the bullet out of his chest and they come out and that's where Lois Lane comes in and starts saying, hey, the hillbillies are running through town. They took the guns from the sheriff and they can't do anything about them now. They're coming here to kill the little guy. 
Uh, oh no! In another scene, we see the little guy that was in the shed being burned alive escape through a floorboard because Superman wasn't fucking there to help him at all. But you know, oh, he had to, uh, he barely saved himself. Y- yeah, he escapes into the night and then goes back to the hole where they came from, goes down, and then comes back up with two more little people and this big scuba tank that is basically some kind of weapon. Uh, very almost obviously repurposed scuba tank yeah so it's it's pretty funny yeah <laughs> you know corny you know uh but fun like, stuff i mean that thing itself looked like a time capsule and so the guy basically has to like carry it on his hip and like hump it <laughs> to use it later in the movie <laughs> When they actually use it, they have one guy go down on all fours, and then the guy puts it on his hip, like, <laughs> on the back of the guy on all fours, and shoots this really ineffective weapon <laughs> at, directly at the guy and does not kill him. You would think, or seemingly hurt him in any way, shape, or form. You would think that uh, their weapons would be a bit more portable. You would think, yeah, not instead these of giant like something tanks. that requires two people just to use. <laughs> My God. I mean, bullet kills you pretty quick. (laughs) That little scuba tank light gun wasn't really doing a whole lot, was it? But maybe that's just me. Yeah. Science must have progressed differently six miles under the earth. I guess. (coughs) Uh, So uh, we get to this point where the hillbilly justice is trying to be carried out. Superman goes and addresses them at the entrance. Lois Lane's out there, too, and almost gets shot. And again, the only reason she's there is to demonstrate how serious they are about getting to this guy. And Superman saves her because she's an idiot and she doesn't know how to get out of the way of a bullet. <laughs> uh, so it Let's be real. Goes, Go ahead, dog. For... Go, get inside. Her, Stay her away from the doors. Her purpose for being there was to demonstrate what a working woman is like, which is apparently just loud and aggressive and obstructive and just th- this woman is just always in the way can't yeah. she just get in line and let superman do his thing yeah by uh, violating the second amendment <laughs> oh it hurts now the third violation <coughs> the american way so the hillbillies are out front trying to enact hillbilly justice uh, Superman takes a bunch of bullets from them, and then he, the, he says, you can't be trusted with guns. I'm going to take them away from you. Which, by that, he Oof. means just taking it out of their hand and throwing it away. Or bending them right in front of them. Yeah, so he does his thing. Superman he, saves the day, uh, more he, or less. He, by he bends guns and slaps bitches. Yep. Meanwhile, the three mole men with their scuba tank come walking into town. The older hillbilly that shot one earlier uh, sees them and runs to tell head hillbilly that, hey, they're coming. Uh, (laughs) Head hillbilly, meanwhile, is holding everybody hostage at the sheriff's office. Yeah. And he takes the rifle from one of the guys there, the shotgun, one or the other, and decides he's going to take care of this himself. (laughs) And he goes off into town to kill the other three mole men. Uh, This is the point where Superman comes out and sees the three little mole men about to get ambushed by the guy. The mole men see him, throw up their scuba tank, uh, do their little doggy style motion, and shoot their, (laughs) their weird light gun. At uh, it was it was light in sound because there was definitely a weird sound yeah. coming out of that if, thing. If you need a trophy chest of weird sci-fi sound effects, this is the place to go. Mm-hmm. Get your theremin on. <laughs> uh, a lot of <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this highly ineffective light gun is. Hitting the the hillbilly, the hillbilly is freaking out, as you'd expect. Superman uh, brings out the injured mole man, runs over, puts the injured mole man into the arms of one of them, <laughs> <laughs> and stands in front of the light gun until they stop, and then says in English, "We are here in peace. We are not going to hurt you. Go back where you came from." <laughs> you know, doing the typical talk slowly, motion away type of thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Again, 50s white people, not surprised. <laughs> Dude, literally to the surprise of no one. Uh, and they kind of get the message. Uh, he walks over to Benson, the head hillbilly, and the hill- hillbilly's thankful that he saved his life, even though it didn't seem like anything was happening. Um, 
He goes, it's more than what you deserve. So Superman just telling him, you should have been killed. (laughs) Again, being the least super Superman ever. You only live by my mercy. (laughs) (laughs) And then Superman picks up the the mole man and walks away with them uh, to take them back to their home. Uh, they go back down, and then they blow up the the oil field, basically, uh, mm-hmm. to make sure that they can't come back after them. But again, you know, it's not like nobody's ever going to drill again, you know, unless it was just this very specific pocket in this very specific place where they were. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so very silly, you know, but you know, 50s comic books, uh, 50 comic book writing. Well, um, I'll give them a pass. Yeah. The writing sensibilities back then were far different than they are now. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, the, it's basically over at that point, you know. Yeah. Nothing more really comes of it. Um, I oh oh, there is a lesson that Lois espouses right at the end of the movie. <laughs> that lesson being, I think, what they mean to say in destroying the drill is, "You live your life." And we'll live ours. Yeah. Very uh, separate but equal, don't you think? Oh! There's a little bit of of Jim Crow in there. A little bit of Crow. Oh, 50s. Oh, boy. 50s, how'd you do that? Oh, man. (laughs) Oh, it hurts. Yeah. (laughs) So, there's a few things to note in this episode. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, movie. (laughs) Movie. Yeah. Um, First up, I think there's a generally speaking before you get into the <laughs> the things and the nitty gritties of it the general vibe uh and the general story has a good moral behind it which is to say don't jump to conclusions and judge people just because they're different than you you know don't act initially with hostility because you don't know what you're doing you know don't act out of fear that's heavily emphasized the the point of fear and acting in fear of a different people. Uh, yeah, Superman are, goes out of his way to say this only happened because you were all afraid. Yeah, which is a great line, and that, and to give this movie its fair shake. Yeah, that that is a good thing. It's that, that comes so, out of it. It's yeah. that sort of thing that actually was my reasoning behind giving it a C minus because mm. there's a good general morality behind it. Now, if you look at it through a magnifying lens and you notice oh you know we're uh violating freedom of the press or vi- violating giving people the truth over letting them live in safe ignorance you know we're <laughs> implying very strongly separate but equal is the best way to go at the end uh, uh we're degrading it- the f- one female character throughout the entire experience and she's nothing but a stereotypical nagging loud uh, dumb you know quote unquote woman and the uh very very interesting um thing that i took away from uh the middle of that movie which was uh superman has a line in which he says i like you can't be trusted to have your firearms yeah it's like which is obviously <laughs> implying that uh perhaps this is true of a lot of people <laughs> yeah <laughs> which would go against the whole quote unquote american way now yeah, that- regardless of how you feel about it personally i get it uh but you gotta understand if you're quote the american way and your <laughs> your core tenant is violating one of the bill of rights it's probably not the american way right oh i i mean i'm sure it's an american way yeah <laughs> uh but you know it's, yeah it, you can take that however you want it we're just reading more into it than we probably should but yeah uh, it, this was this is a very weird movie just for no other reason than the way it depicts superman as uh super but in like the worst sense yeah. and it's like bullets can't harm him he knows better than you um uh, he's the only one who can get the job done um uh, you should always listen to superman because uh well he's literally the the big brother to the entire human race 
what the hell? Yeah. So <laughs> it's when you watch this, you can kind of understand oh. why uh, Lex Luthor would have a vendetta against Superman sometimes, mm-hmm. because this is kind of the Superman that Lex Luthor implies exists, mm-hmm. <laughs> and many uh, interpretations of Lex Luthor. Oh, uh, yeah. Like when Lex Luthor talks about the kind of Superman that he's afraid of, this movie puts that that kind of Superman on full display. Yeah. So, uh, again, generally good moral behind the entire experience. But if you look in, at the nitty gritties of it, maybe not so much. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of historical isms, you know, that their knowledge of radioactivity and their fear of it and caution with it. Uh, they're talking, he, Clark Kent or Superman, I don't remember which one, starts calling the the raging hillbillies uh, stormtroopers, you know, Nazi, oh, Nazi stormtroopers. Yeah. Tro- yeah, he, he made a Nazi equivocation. That yeah. was... Which, again, very fresh in the mind because yeah. <laughs> six years after the war ended, so I'm sure... Yeah, that was... I, that's another thing that I was not prepared for with this movie. <laughs> yeah, so a oh lot of fifties isms, a lot of Cold War war isms, a lot of um, you know World War Two, post World War Two isms. Uh, they use a lot of outdated terms, like uh, I, I believe at the beginning of the movie, Lois Lane says, "What a duck of a situation," or something like that. Um, <laughs> Again, very very old school. <laughs> it's like I'm sorry, gold what? era <laughs> terms, you know, that don't make sense to the modern ears, but uh, obviously made sense back then. So there's a lot of cool historical context that you can watch this from an educational point of view and kind of see how media was portrayed back then. And it's fun from a, a film perspective to kind of see how they handled these transitions and how they used their practical effects and what they were limited to and how they accomplished these different things. Like, yeah. I think one of the funniest things I thought when I, I first watched the movie was that the, all the credits are in the very beginning. And they're short. (laughs) It's like three screens of credits. And now, to be fair, they weren't crediting everybody like they do now, um, which is definitely a good thing. But uh, (laughs) it's just funny how small these crews and and groups were before, you know, we had all the special effects people and the CG and the, uh, you know, the three or four writers per movie and the, you know, all the musicians Uh, and all the techs and all the assistants, you know, lighting guy. Yeah. Key grip. Best boy. You can see why they made a feature length film with $2 million. Oh, you yeah. Know, when you see the credits and you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, th- I mean, that that's another thing about it is that it seemed as though even by the standards of the time, it came off a little cheap. Yeah. So you wonder, like I said, it, to me, it felt like a kind of rough not great episode of twilight zone you know yeah th- this seemed like not just that but also kind of a proof of concept yeah so it's pretty interesting um really cool uh, eventually this became the adventures of superman the tv series um and it ended up becoming a two-part episode uh to premiere the show after being a feature-length film um Again, it's not the first time we saw a comic book based kind of featurette or anything like that. That that stuff had been going on for years and years and years from serials and all sorts of stuff. Uh, you know, twelve part, twenty four part serials that would run as a short film and before a movie. Um, the first one that I could actually find of a, the serials was actually not a DC property. It was actually Captain Marvel, which is now known as Shazam which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. That was actually the first kind of serial uh, with a comic book property. And then they had several shorts before that of kind of like war-based and detective-based comics. Oh, yeah. Um, So a lot of stuff like that out there. Uh, Just thought it was really cool, really unique. Um, It's come out in several mediums, so if you want to support it and go out and purchase it, that's fine. But again, we have that uh, daily motion link where you can enjoy it. but yeah, there's 
I was very entertained now by the this movie more because of the historical context and because of the uh, artistic influences and the the dialogue, the way people phrased and the way people pronounced words and everything uh, back then. Um, <laughs> it's the acting. I'd say the only one that's actually a good actor throughout this entire experience is the uh, foreman. Yeah. I thought he was the only one that was kind of believable. Yeah. Um, but everybody else was very over the top and kind of corny. And, a you little know. bit. Uh, Clark Kent winks after every time. Every time he says a clever line or something, he winks at the camera, yeah. uh, which is really jarring. Yeah. <laughs> I noticed that right away and thought it was really funny. Um, it's like, damn, this, this guy really likes the smell of his own farts, you know? <laughs> 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 oh uh, my god <laughs> but generally speaking you know his it, farts are perfect they come from krypton <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kryptonian farts <laughs> kryptonian battle farts <laughs> is that what he calls his pants oh i'm sure yeah so it's it's very strange it's not the superman we're used to it's not the lowest lane we're used to um but it certainly is uh an object of its time um, yeah, yeah. It was released November twenty third, nineteen fifty one. It was about an hour long, so easy watch. Uh, really high, highly recommend you go watch it and let us know your thoughts on it. Uh, there's some pretty funny, you know, promotional materials you can look up on Google. Yeah, uh, obviously it's Wikipedia page we're looking at right now just to cover our bases. Uh, just <laughs> it's funny seeing the poster, you know. Um, <laughs> oh you know, yeah, time Ace of Action. In his uh, first full-length feature adventure. Yeah. It's uh, like all-time ace of action. Really? Yeah. So, oh, oh. Uh, oh, my God. Okay. It's that, that scene where the mole man literally has to save himself. I spent most of that scene just saying... And then Superman shows up. <laughs> he really did. And he then watched it sitting next to me. And, and then Superman shows up here. Now. <laughs> Anytime. A- any, any minute now, Superman is going to swoop in and save this mole man. No. No. <laughs> no. The, this little guy in a burning shed literally had to find a floorboard that was loose and crawl through it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was interesting. So, uh, do I think it's a good movie? No, <laughs> but do yeah. I think it's worth the watch for the historical context, for the entertainment value, for the corniness aspect? To see what Superman used to be. You know, there's no cold breath going on. There's no super speed. You know, it's beyond very, flying. very basic. Yeah, it's. It's super strength and I can fly basically and I'm invulnerable. You know, that's basically yeah. the powers on display, no heat vision or anything like that. So again, Superman of the era, a lot more inner you know a lot more reserved version of Superman before he eventually became what we know him today as the super over P, you know, every power you can imagine and then still coming up with new powers because you yeah. know, he's not OP enough. I I'd be interested to see when the the old cartoons were airing because uh this version of Superman I'm pretty sure would have been slapped across the face a few times by the cartoon version <laughs> that was far more effective. Yeah, probably. So, now <laughs> Lois Lane's probably the worst Lois Lane I've ever seen. And I'm, yep, I'm glad down. I'm glad this is not the modern Lois Lane because it is rough. Mm. Um, not to say that Phyllis Coates did a role poorly. It's just I'm sure what she, she was did given exactly to work with. What she was told to do. It's yeah. just that the writing for that character was awful. Yeah. So that's <laughs> it's it's tough to swallow, but uh, it it is what it is. So. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap everything up. Again, Emery gave it a D. I gave it a C minus on a heavy curve. Uh, and then we average out to a D plus. So this movie gets a D plus. But because this is the first movie we have reviewed in our comic book movie master list series, it is the best comic movie of all time.
according to Hit the Books podcast, as of March 22nd, 2020. And technically, in 1951, it would have been the best for the very same reason, because it's the first. There's only one. There's only one. (laughs) We have nothing else to go off of. So we'll see how it stacks up against the next movie. Let me just check real quick my Excel spreadsheet to see what the next one officially is. Uh, So you have that information. While I'm looking it up, please remember you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash hit the books. You can always reach out to us on HTB vids on Twitter. You can reach out to us at facebook.com forward slash hit the books. You can always email us at hit the books vids, V I D S at gmail.com. Um, feel free to check us out on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, Podbean, and on YouTube, uh, where we really appreciate it. If you give us a like, give us a good rating, subscribe, hit the bell if you want those notifications, and then let us know what your thoughts are on every episode, on every topic of the week, on our podcast, and let us know what you thought of this movie. Where do you think you would grade it at? Do you grade it on a curve because of the era, because we're viewing it through a modern lens, or do you give it a little bit more... uh, a little bit more leeway. A little bit more forgiveness. And let's face it, it's not the worst thing in the world to give them a little forgiveness from time to time. Which is why I graded on a heavy curve. It's a very, very heavy curve <laughs> that you graded this <laughs> thing on. So, the next movie coming up uh, will be officially 1966's Batman, starring none other than Adam West. I think this actually might be one of my favorite Batman movies. Oh, boy. (laughs) So uh, look forward to that. That is coming down the pipeline. If there is a free way to watch it, I will be posting it on our Twitter account, on our Facebook. I might even make an Instagram to help you fucking nerds out looking at booty pics all day. Uh, But uh, I know we're living in trying times right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's give the people a little more credit than oh, fine. looking at them picks. I guess I'll grade you people on a curve, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking nerds. A heavy, heavy curve. I give you double D. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dynamite's going to love this episode. Uh, shit. Don't get us into boundless territory. <laughs> <laughs> so look forward to that. 1966's Batman. Uh, if I can find a free option to watch it, I will post it on our different social medias. And then obviously I'll post a link on our YouTube channel and the, the podcast services. So you can watch it free of charge without any uh, additional issues. Now, of course, if you want to support it, by all means, support it. Uh, support your comic book media when and where you can. If I can't find a free option, I'll tell you where you can purchase it and watch it uh, otherwise. Uh, and we'll get into that, and we'll finally have another movie to compare this movie with, and we'll see. Does 1966's Batman stand up against 1951's Superman and the Mole Men? What would, ten, not 10, 15 years difference make for this one? We'll find out. Not sure. And uh, one thing I did forget to mention earlier, mm-hmm. for the sake of these reviews... I did notice when I was looking up all of these movies that there is literally unauthorized porn versions of a lot of comic book properties. Oh my god! That were sold by the companies that owned them, even though they weren't approved by the creators. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Those will not be reviewed, most likely, unless you really request them. I don't think you will, but if you do, uh, we'll have no choice. But I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's probably what you want. I- Look, I know comic book creators were strapped for cash, but I don't Speaking think Speaking of strapped, I don't think anyone needed to get this kind of bang for their buck. <laughs> so yeah, look forward to that. It is coming down the pipeline, and I believe you will all enjoy it talking about Adam West. May he rest in peace. And Burt Ward. And Burt Ward. So, get your shark repellent ready. We're going to have a lot of fun. Without further ado, we love you all. Thank you for sticking around and watching the first premiere episode of Comic Movie Master List. CMM. There are many to come. And, of course, be sure to watch our weekly podcast, Hit the Books Podcast. Every week, 
to discuss your favorite comic books and comic book media. Till next time. Truth, justice, and the American way. When it's convenient. When it's convenient. Very convenient. You know what? Screw that. (laughs) (laughs) Love you all. Goodbye. (laughs) Bye. <laughs>